Okay, so this is pH 3119, right? Is everyone supposed to be in this? This is the first in the acoustic sequence, first course in the acoustic sequence. All right, I know some of you, but just some. Um, okay, so you, I think you all know this is a combination resident and a uh, distance learning course, right? So we have um, many more students than we normally have. Usually we have the magic number, which is seven. It's magic because less than that, we have to pay it in the administration. They don't pay us, something like that. Something like that. I don't, I, don't, I don't pay attention to that stuff. So we have a lot more students here, and we have a lot more distance learning students than we normally do. There's a total of 38 students in this class. So imagine you're teaching the course. How, do you, how would you feel? Terrible. Yeah, because there's a lot of grading and yeah, so it's, it's going to be a trouble, but you know, we'll adapt. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let me go over, let's go over the, um, the information page here, or whatever it's called. Okay, all this stuff is on Sakai, right? Um, so uh, here's information on me, and for those of you who've had me before, and those of you who haven't, it's 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 uh, just not efficient for me to have regular office hours, definite office hours. It's just not efficient, especially here, and especially for this particular situation. So you can see me. We'll make arrangements if you want to see me. You can uh, you can drop by, but it's better to usually make an appointment over email. That's the best way to do it, okay? You can also s set up an appointment before or after class, right? Is that clear? So even though I don't have any posted office hours, don't worry, we can handle it. I want to make sure everyone understands that because I got in trouble many years ago <laughs> with uh, a one particularly bad student. But uh, I want to make sure that everyone understands that, that we will, you know, you want to see me, you'll be able to come to my office. We just need to set up a time, all right? As far as the distance learning students go, it's, um, it's a similar thing, except uh, if we meet, it'll be with a telephone conference, okay, rather than face-to-face. -face. But the same statement applies. If they, you know, they want to s discuss something with, my, with me in my office hours, just send me an email message and we'll, we'll arrange. We'll arrange for a time. Uh, so... This is meeting at noon because we had a change in schedule. I don't know if you guys know how it works around here, but it's, don't, forget it. I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> um, so we're going to meet. This is, we'll typically have three lectures and one problem session in a week, but it varies, and the problem sessions will float around. And that'll be on the syllabus, which we'll look at ne next. Um, when you have Sakai problems, Right, talk to Gene, he's right back there, okay? You can drop by and see him. His office is in back of the demo room, 141, where we keep all of our lecture demonstrations. Um, you can just drop by and see him, or you can call him or send him an email message. Uh, the lab is Friday, 8 to 10. Um, Jay Adef, <coughs> I'll be there, but Jay Adef really runs the lab. Um, I wonder if I can get him to grade the lab reports. Uh, probably not, right? <laughs> I'd love to be able to do that. Anyway, Jay is very knowledgeable in acoustics. He has a master's degree from here in acoustics, right? He's also a professional photographer specializing in ice figure skating. And the reason I'm telling you that just is kind of interesting. But um, he will sometimes be gone, just not here for several weeks because he's out at some competition or something, you know, taking photographs. And I think that looks like that may be, we will hit that in the syllabus next, okay? I'll point that out when we look at the syllabus. Uh, often we reschedule this, but I, I, because Python has this, it should be okay for all of you. And uh, usually we'll reschedule it for a Thursday afternoon. But we have a lot of students here, that's going to be true. The more students, the hard, harder it is to reschedule. And also, um, I just think with the way things are this quarter, it's probably best to do it on Friday morning, right? Now, the distance learning students will be, the way we do it here, and we've been doing it for a number of times, is um, 
They'll be sent the data. Jay will take data and it'll be posted on Sakai. You will not use that data. I want to be clear about that. <laughs> right, you will take your own data. And that's good because we can look at you know, interesting things come up that way. You know, you can, that's why we do experiments. Um, so the distance learning students will use Jay's data. Um, they will form groups of three or four. Four is a lot of students to have in a group, but I just think, you know, because of this unusual situation with so many students, you guys will form groups of three. Okay, you'll be four groups of three. Four is the maximum number of stations we have, equipment. Okay, now did everybody, yeah, we have 12 students here. Okay, so you'll form, and they don't, you can, if you've got a problem with your a group member, you can change, you know, um, it's going to take me a while to learn how to talk again cause, because of the break. <laughs> I just can't talk. Uh, and I was working hard on a manuscript, journal manuscripts, which, which I will inevitably talk about in here. There's just no way. I'll somehow make a connection. Don't worry. <laughs> and you'll hear all about it. It's really interesting stuff, of course. But anyway, uh, getting back, what was I talking about? The groups? Yeah, so um, you know, you can change members, but we need to have four groups of three, right? And you'll take your own data. And uh, somewhere along here, I'm gonna talk about, well, let me just follow this, we'll hit it. Uh, prerequisites, you need some basic, you know, introductory physics, mechanics. I think all of you have had something like this. Here's the, this is the mathematical physics course that we have here. Um, how many have not had that, have not had this? You've all had it? Okay, there we go. Yeah, about half of you have not had it. Yeah, well I think you'll probably be able to get by. We'll develop, you know, for example, we're going to be doing some uh, partial differential. I think we're going to be doing some, no, maybe that's next quarter. Well. My experience is, um, you know, as an example, we're going to be dealing with Bessel functions in this course. Dreaded Bessel that everybody dreads, okay? So it helps if you've seen, it's a special function of mathematical physics, so it will help if you've seen them before, but it's absolutely, it's not a absolutely necessary. You'll adapt and, you know, and I'll explain things to you. So I don't, I don't know how serious this is, but I think it is in the catalog, I think. Uh, Here's the textbook. This is a standard worldwide textbook in acoustics. There are some competitors out there, but this is pretty much the main book around the world. It's written by professors in the physics department here. One of them's still alive, Sanders. I haven't seen him for a while. I don't know how he's doing. But um, <coughs> it's, uh, and I'll have more to say about this in a moment, okay? But this is the textbook we're going to use. And on the the goods on the positive side, many people use it as a reference. Many researchers use it as a reference. Okay, oh boy. Does that, I heard, I heard something, Gene. Gene. Oh. Yeah, it's just somebody connecting. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, sorry, I've forgotten. It's been a while. Somebody else. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll have more to say about this in a moment, but I just want you guys to realize this is everybody, Minnie. Hello. Yes, hello. This is Tom Engel uh, over at Newark. Hi, Tom. This is uh, Jason Moore over at Newark, too. I'm trying to, trying to get on to the live stream thing or the, or on to the, um, the uh, collaborate session, but I don't see any sessions available to log on to. Yeah, so we don't use uh, collaborate. Oscillation and waves. Check back here at 12 specific time, which is 10 minutes, 10 minutes ago. It ain't, it ain't streaming none. No, and what I thought we were supposed to go do is that collaborate session. No. Now there's there's a little lag here in the. So, um, I would be telling us to check back at. Uh, 10 minutes ago for the live stream, there wasn't a live stream. Yeah, plus it looks the, the lesson that we're supposed to have, so. 
Hey, hey, you guys, can you hear us? Can, hold on, hold on a second. Oh, wait, they don't know the live stream is streaming. But, uh... We can't, uh, can we communicate with them? Turn, uh, turn the mute back on. Oh, the mute is on. Damn, I forgot about the mute. Uh, it's been a number of years. Yeah, go ahead and press the mute button. Where's the mute button? I'm trying to get onto the collaborate session, but there's nothing, nothing shows up. Oh, I got it. recording, let's see the recording. Okay, stop. Watch that. Did you get something? Stop. Sorry, we had the mute button inadvertently on. Okay. Gene, you want so to tell? There's a tab. There's a tab on Sakai inside 3119. This is live stream. Do you see it? I see a tab live stream. Uh, uh, yes, and I clicked on that. And it says check back ten minutes ago for the live stream. But yes. when I try to play the live stream, okay. I, don't, I get no server found. Yep. Okay, that means you guys, are, are you guys are you guys behind your NMCI network? Yeah. That's why. Oh, that's the only way we have to access. No, you, um, Gene sent out an, an, an email mess, a lengthy email message regarding all this. Did you get it? Apparently not. Oh, no, this was last week. Thursday. Thursday or Friday. Yeah, it was that. Okay, well, I'm at, I'm at home, logged on to my NCMI laptop. Why? Yeah, yeah, you can't, you don't want to do that. <laughs> They're gonna, have, they're gonna have to catch the pre-recorded lecture, so. Okay. Yeah, we've already discussed this, unfortunately. Okay, uh, make sure you read Gene's email message dated. Um, Thursday, yeah, it was on Thursday. Thursday, last Thursday. Yeah. Okay, and we'll, we'll, get this, we'll get this worked out, all right? Is it not possible to read that message and then come in in the middle? It's, it's not possible to look at the live stream on your NM, NMCI network because your NMCI network is blocking streaming right now. Oh, yeah, well, until, until three, oh, no, no, after three o'clock it doesn't block it. Right, but then at, after three o'clock you can catch the pre-recorded lectures. Well, oh, they can't watch the lectures live after three o'clock? We aren't, we aren't streaming live at three, after three o'clock. It says right here. No, three o'clock Eastern time. Oh, oh, three o'clock Eastern time. Yeah, you guys should be able to watch it if it's okay. technically not locked. But, but it says live stream check back at 12 p.m. Pacific time, and it's now 3.15. Okay, if you can't watch it, then you're still being blocked. Hey, look, guys, we're going to have, this is, a, we got resident students here, and we have, a, we have to, we got 50 right, minutes. Go. So we'll, we'll clear this up, okay? Okay, bye. Okay, thank you. Oh, God. Okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll clear this up. So, what, what was the, who, who sent an email? Gene, somebody? Gene Morris. Yeah, his, there's information on him on the Sakai site. Gene Moore? Morris. He's the webmaster and, oh, the, oh, the webmaster and the videographer for the course. Okay. And there's information on him in the Sakai site. Okay? Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so I'll have more to say about the textbook, but I just want to make sure everyone understands that this is a very, um, around the world, it's used for researchers, acoustics research, as a reference book. Okay? So you know that can't be good for you if they're using it as reference, but I'll, we'll, get to, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we don't really cover a huge amount in this course, which I think is a good thing. Uh, it's chapters, basically chapters one, two, three, and four. And there's roughly only five pages of lecture notes per lecture. Okay, and lecture notes are on Sakai. I need to tell you the lecture notes you'll notice, you've probably noticed they're not typed. And um, the reason you want typed lecture notes is the ease in editing them. So these are handwritten and tough to edit. The problem is I haven't done that because I only infrequently teach this course, but someday I hope to type the lecture notes. Uh, but anyway, we'll get by. Um, and these are on Sakai. Uh, the homework, uh, there's no way that I have time to grade homework. It just gets checked off. So um, I glance at the homework very quickly and put a big check mark on there. If it looks like you've fallen way short, I'll give you a check minus. And to be honest, I very seldom give check minuses, but 
I think it's happened once, but I'm not sure. Uh, if you don't turn anything at all, it just goes, it goes as a zero. This goes as a one in the grade book, in my grade sheet, okay? I think this is 0.3, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, I encourage you to work together when you're working on the problems. I discovered this kind of late in graduate school, but study groups are great. They work really well, studying the course material and just solving problems. You should write it up independent, you know, you should write the solutions individually yourself. But discussing the problems amongst yourselves can be really, um, can be very beneficial. Uh, so we'll typically have one discussion a week, okay? The homework will be due the following week at the end of the week on Friday. Everybody has trouble with this statement here. Okay, here it is right here. So let me say it again. We have a problem session and when we, we discuss the problems, right? You should come in prepared. You should at least look at the problems, try to solve them. It'll be much more efficient if you've looked at the problems and actually given them a shot when, before you walk into class when we discuss them. To really try to do that. I know it's hard to do, but it really is much more efficient. Then the, the homework is due the following week on Friday. Is that clear? And to be honest with you, I, um, it's really a soft deadline. You know, I'm not, you can turn in late homework. I don't know, maybe I shouldn't tell you that, but you know, as long as it's not real late, okay? But this is just, a, the, pro, the homework is for you. It's really for you, okay? Uh, solutions are on Sakai. If you have any questions as we go along here, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, so the way I've handled this for years here, and I picked this up from somebody else who's, who's, who's an acoustician, actually. Um, not that that really matters. I use it for all my courses. I give take-home quizzes. That seems to work well here. So there's no tests, no final. There's take-home quizzes. You'll work on them independently. There's an explanation at the top of the quiz, that uh, a sort of preamble that'll tell you about the quizzes, and we can just skip this for now. It's going to be a little while before we have a quiz. Uh, yeah, it's best just to skip it right now. Uh, we already talked about these. Now, I didn't talk about this. The resident students, what I found works really well as a really a teaching tool is that not to just have students send in to submit a report. Oh, it's one report per group per experiment, obviously, right? So you'll be in a group of three. It's just one report for that group, for each group. And you'll submit it to me and I will grade it. But before you do that, you're gonna make an appointment and come by my office and we're gonna go over your preliminary report. This is a really good thing, okay? It is time consuming, <clears throat> but I found it's a really good thing because I can pick up quickly on major mistakes and you will make major mistakes. So what about the distance learning students? In the past, I've held telephone conferences with each individual group, and it took a lot of time. I mean a lot of time. It's typically a half an hour, 45 minutes. We have so many distance learning students now that um, I think the way we're gonna handle it now is if distance learning students have questions about, if you get stuck on a quiz, you're allowed to talk to me. That's also excellent, an excellent educational tool. Students are really motivated when they're working on a test or a quiz, right? So the distance learning students, you guys will make arrangements to come by and see me in my office. The distance learning students, we're gonna to try to handle this by email and the lab reports by email too. If they have any questions, they should send me an email message and I'll try to clear up over email. If we can't do that, then we will um, have a telephone conference. That's the way it's, I think we should handle it right now. Uh, here's the, how the grades are computed. 20% of your grade is based on homework, 25% lab, 55% quiz. I'll drop the lowest quiz score. There, quiz score. There's a lot of quizzes here. Uh, I think it was nine, I mean, it's kind of a lot. So we'll draw, I'll drop the lowest. We'll be doing four experiments. Uh, here are the grade divisions. So if you get, you know, 96% of all the possible points, you get an A. Um, frequently, I will, I will lower these divisions a little bit. I'm not going to raise them. There's a like a universal law against that. Just 
right? Can you imagine what happened if I said, oh, by the way, at the end of the quarter, it's 96% to 100, you know, it, there'd be a riot. So, um, and I can be influenced. Some students ask, you know, good questions, participate in class, and that can, if you're near the boundary, near one of these boundaries, and um, I can lift you above, you know, right? So, finally, um, I handle this like a normal university. I think there is actually an attendance requirement here, but I don't worry about that. If you, uh, if you can't make it to uh, a lecture or a discussion, the labs, we can, if for some reason you can't make it to a, when Jay presents the lab, you can come back later and do the lab. We, we often do that around here. It's sort of an open lab environment. But um, if you don't, if you can't make it to a lecture or discussion for, for whatever reason, um, it's okay, you don't actually even need to inform me. Most students do, but you don't have to. But you are responsible for everything that, takes for hap that happens, okay? All right, any questions about this, this sheet? Uh, you can look it over at your leisure and, and if you can always ask me questions. Okay, so here's the syllabus. We'll, um, I think we'll adhere to this pretty closely. I mean, you never know what's going to happen, but, um, and it's, uh, it's not a really detailed syllabus here, it's just got the basic ch chapters here. Uh, but like I said, we'll be following very closely. And here we hit a, usually there, we don't do an experiment the first week, it's better to do the second week. But the reason we're doing it is because <coughs> down the road here, you see this, Jay on leave through, this. Jay's gone. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> I don't know, doing what? I don't know, but it could be photographing ice skaters, I don't know. Um, but anyway, because of that, I've had to move things around a little bit. So we're actually going to start doing the experiments this, um, this week, this Friday, okay? The handouts are on Sakai, right? Okay. And in this particular experiment, I need to give you an introduction. I think in this class, this, it's just this one introduction. It varies from course to course, but here um, I do need to talk to you. We'll devote a whole lecture to, uh, to experiment one. Uh, let's see, let me look down here. This is no meeting, it means no meeting. Uh, yeah, now what I should have done, I think I'll edit this. This is not the end of technically the last <coughs> day of the last day of classes is the following Tuesday, and I should have put that in here. So tentatively, we have no meeting on Monday and Tuesday of the eleventh week. Okay, but I, I want to. I think I do need to edit that um, because you never know what's going to happen, right? We may need those two days, so don't leave town early, okay, <laughs> so, or whatever. So I'm going to, I'll revise this, um, but as it stands now, and it's, usually there's no problem, but you just never know, there are two more days remaining in the quarter, We're, we don't need them, okay, to meet. You'll be working away, you know, you'll probably still be working on this, and there'll be a quiz from here, so you'll still be working. Okay, anybody have any quick questions about the syllabus? Okay, again, you can look this over at your leisure. And so anybody have any general, um, it's going to take a while to get used to this. Anybody have any general questions about the class? Anything at all? All groups, so all groups are in the lab at the same time? Uh, that's a good question. For this, I was thinking about that actually a while ago. For this course, Standing weights on strings, simple harmonic motion, data reduction, error analysis, waves and bars. Yeah, we will, we have enough setups for you guys to work simultaneously. Now you can always rearrange to do it at some other time if, if there's some some problem, right? Oh, you guys don't know this, do you? Yeah. So Jay is very amenable to this. There's it's no problem if you, uh, but you want to be there when we when we meet at eight o'clock on Friday because he will introduce the lab to you. But that if you have to take off and you want to do the, take the data later, you can do that. Yeah, it's an open lab kind of environment, except for that introduction by Jay. Does that help?
James? We'll just have to make it work with a few of our other instructors because we have uh, lectures or lives from 8 to 10 on Friday, too. Uh, Python's not supposed to allow yeah. that to happen. It's, it'll work out. It's for modern. I think there's only a couple. So. Oh, yeah, modern is real. The yeah. labs are real simple. Yeah, so it'll be but is it, uh, is it, this is, is this in Python for, is the modern? Uh, yeah, in I mean, that's a conflict in the whole idea that software is to not allow that. Their syllabus and what Python or Flex are different. Uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll talk to the other instructors. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you can work it out. And the modern stuff, the modern, who's teaching that? <coughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll work it out somehow. Okay, any other general questions? Uh, okay, so let's get started here with the uh, material. So I guess this was the first time I taught this. And, um, and I teach it like, you know, on the average once every three or four years, which is kind of like no man's land. You know, you want to teach a course, either you teach it or you don't, right, for a while and you move on, but I don't know, it just happened this way. And it's the, reason, the main reason I haven't typed these notes. Um, now, here's the, the textbook, as I was talking about before. This is considered to be a dual-use textbook. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear somebody say dual-use, I usually just turn around and walk away. Okay. So what do I mean by dual? First of all, what do I mean by dual-use? It's supposed to be can serve as a textbook or as a reference book for researchers. So you can, you can imagine the problem, right? You suffer. The students suffer. People first time through suffer. And there's just no way around this. You can't have a book that researchers use. It's not going to be look really complicated to students the first time through. It's just not going to, ha you know, it's the way it's going to be. So I'm kind of I'm your guide here to get you through this. Okay, that's that's how I sort of view myself here. Um, and then a number of you will actually use this in your research. You're going to be doing acoustic theses, right? So. Um, and the distance learning students, they'll be using it in their jobs, probably. So it is a, you know, again, it's the sort of the top, I think, acoustics reference book in the world. And as a textbook, it's a little steep. It looks, it'll look, it's, um, it can be intimidating, but don't worry, we'll get through it, okay? Uh, and I, as you all know, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first course in this sequence of acoustics. And we're actually not going to do acoustics. Well, we're not going to do sound. I don't know how else to say this. We're, it, you can kind of think of this material as pre-acoustics. And it's really not good just to jump directly into sound and fluids. Sound is a wave that exists in fluids. Um, it's better to do, spend a lot of time, a whole course, on doing background material. We start off with oscillators, simple harmonic oscillator. This is really at the root of acoustics. Waves on a string, transverse waves on a string, that's very similar to acoustics. So you pick up and you learn a lot here. And um, this is not revolutionary. This has been going on for roughly a century. This is the proper way to learn acoustics is you start with this sort of pre-acoustics, uh, oscillators and vibratory systems like strings, bars, waves on bars, okay? And then we get into, this is all one dimensional, then we get into higher dimensions, waves on a membrane. And uh, we're not gonna be doing plates, it's, uh, they get a little complicated, uh, but other I've talked to other instructors of 3119, they also don't do plates. But if you have to do, if you have to get involved in, this is transverse vibrations of a plate, right? That's got a plate and it can vibrate. Um, if you get involved in that in research, open up KFCS, right? You'll be able to, with all of this under your belt, you'll be able to understand, you'll be able to figure that out. Um, let me see if I'm, Getting anything here? Yeah. Okay. And again, as, as I lecture, feel free to ask questions. Right? Okay, so we're going to begin with just a, the simplest oscillatory system. Waves are an oscillatory phenomenon, right? They involve, sound, for example, involves compressions and expansions. Sound wave traveling this way looks something like this. There's compressions and expansions. 
they're longitudinal. The expansions and compressions are in the same direction as the wave is traveling. Um, but the point is, the medium here, the fluid, the particles in there are oscillating. So it's pretty clear that we need to begin with just a single oscillator. And again, this is important because what we learn from this, we're, you're going to be using for many courses to come in acoustic sequence. Uh, oh, and I should say something else just occurred to me. Um, thanks, Michael. KFCS love impedance, okay? So you all heard the word impedance. Well, they just, some people jokingly call it a book, book of impedance. So it'll be introduced in oscillators here. And it is, and to be honest with you, when I first taught this, I'd never used impedance in my research. But it, it really is the proper way to do acoustics. So right near the beginning, when we just talk about the simple harmonic oscillator, we will introduce the whole concept of impedance that you'll use for many courses to come in the, se <coughs> in the sequence. All right, so here's a, um, an ideal system of a mass on a spring. This is, it's rigid, this is a rigid wall here. Uh, don't worry about any friction or dissipation. We'll, we'll deal with that later. And uh, we're just going to look at one-dimensional motion here, right? The system, we know that this mass is going to oscillate back and forth, about an equilibrium location. Um, now, there are different types of oscillators, but this is sort of the prototype. This is the standard case. And many of the aspects of this will carry over to other, oscill other oscillators. So this is sort of the standard simple system. To mathematically describe what's going on here, we use the fact that the force exerted by a spring is proportional to the displacement from equilibrium. And I better stay away from that for right now. So when the spring is unstretched or uncompressed here, okay, this, that's going to be equilibrium. If I let the mass go when the spring is unstretched or uncompressed, it's just going to sit there. Right? There's no force on the mass. If I displace this a certain distance, let's say I pull it out a certain distance, there'll be a restoring force, a force in the opposite direction. That's why we have this minus sign here. When x is positive, there's a negative force. When x is negative, there's a positive force. So we call it a restoring force. I didn't write that down here. That's why the minus sign is there. Uh, most of you are wondering why this isn't, it looks like I had, <laughs> I didn't notice this in my notes. Um, Usually people write this as F is equal to minus KX. It's the famous Hooke's Law. And we are going to, KFCS use a lowercase s for this, called the spring constant. It's this proportionality constant here. And the reason we do that is we have to use K as the wave number. And anybody working with waves, universally, lowercase K is the wave number. It's 2 pi over the wavelength. And some of you have seen this before. If you haven't, don't worry. You, you will see it uh, soon enough. <laughs> uh, so that's why they use this lowercase s. Um, this is the, most people call this the spring constant. It represents a stiffness in the system. You know, the bigger this is, the harder I have to exert a force to move this over here. And all oscillations will require some kind of stiffness some kind of restoring force returning you to equilibrium. And all systems involve some kind of inertia. If you didn't have inertia, you'd have infinite acceleration. You have a finite force on zero mass. So what plays the role of the inertia here is just, in this case, is simply the mass. But we're going to find when we <coughs> look at different systems, for example, vibrating bars like this, that um, it may not be appropriate to deal with a spring constant, but the concept of a stiffness, something returning you to equilibrium, and the concept of inertia will always be there in one form or another. Okay, so these are general concepts, stiffness and inertia. In this case, the stiffness is the spring constant, the Hooke's law constant, the inertia is just the mass. Okay, so Newton's second law is that the force is the mass, the net force on a mass equals the mass times the acceleration. So if we plug in Hooke's law here, you can do this in your head, I think. We take this expression, plug it into here, put everything on one side of the equation, 
and divide by the mass, and this is what we get. Now, if you have trouble seeing this, you might want to just derive it. It's real simple. And after a while, you won't, you'll see this stuff in your head. Okay? So this is, what, this is a statement of Newton's second law for this ideal mass on a spring. Uh, it's put in the standard form. We have descending derivatives here. This is second derivative. And you'll notice something here. It's kind of interesting. M and S by themselves are not really important. It's just the ratio that's important. So you might think, oh, our system has two parameters here, S and N. And that's true, it does. But to describe the system, theoretically at least, all that's important is the ratio. So we call that. We define, it's natural to define, you'll see why in the next page. We define this omega naught to be the square root of S over M. So what sits here is just S over M, which comes from here. Okay, only the ratio is what's relevant, S and M. So that's going to be, we have a one parameter system here. Yeah? Uh, is that omega frequency? We're going to talk about that. We don't know that yet, right? Yeah, we'll get there. But the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, this is, uh, this is the equation of simple harmonic motion sometimes denoted by SHM, capital, capital <coughs> S, okay? This is a standard equation that describes oscillatory motion. We'll see that, I think, on the next page here. Um, yeah, it's called simple harmonic motion. Um, and the reason is that the, if you look at the displacement of the mass, it oscillates sinusoidally in time. So here are some possible solutions. And again, if you can't see this in your head, you can just do it. If you substitute in some a constant amplitude, this is called the amplitude, you substitute the cosine of omega naught t into the differential equation of motion, you see what's going to happen here? What happens with... Um, what happens when I differentiate this once? What do I get? I get minus, yeah. Now we've got to use the chain. Most of you know this, but maybe it's good to say it here. I differentiate, when I differentiate a cosine, I get minus the sine, right? And by the chain rule, I'm differentiating with respect to time, I've got to bring out an omega here, right? When we do take another time derivative, which we need for Newton's second law, now when I differentiate that, what's going to happen? The derivative of the sine is the cosine, and I bring out another omega, So I get this. So if you substitute the cosine of omega t and the amplitude, there's, we can have any amplitude here. Can everybody see that? I have an amplitude here, an amplitude here, they just cancel. So this is a linear differential equation. Our solution here holds for any amplitude in our, in our model. Okay, I've just left it out here, but we can put an, any amplitude in here. Obviously, because it's just going to scale out, it's just going to divide out. But you can see that when we substitute the cosine of omega t into here, we get minus omega squared cosine omega, and we get, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, didn't I? We want to put zeros here. This is omega naught. Sorry. Okay. So, can you see that it works? Everybody can see that? Yeah. If you can't see that the cosine of omega naught t is a solution to this equation with an, any amplitude, you need to sit down and do that, okay? Uh, okay, what about the sine of omega naught t? That's going to work too. Okay? When we differentiate the sine, we get the cosine. When we differentiate again, the minus sign, it works. It works too. Right? So we have these two possible solutions here. What if we add two solutions together? Do we get a solution? Yes, that's true uh, because we have a linear system here. X only appears to the first power here. So if I have a, um, suppose X1, X2, suppose these are solutions. And in our case, oops, in our case, uh, is there enough light, Gene? Let me know if, if there's anything I can do. 
uh, let's say this is the solution. You can think of this as the cosine. This is the solution. This is the sine, right? If you consider the sum here, is that going to be a solution? Can you guys see that? The answer is yes, and let me, let me show you if you don't see it. The reason is, okay, the reason, here's our differential equation, right? Oh, uh, common, I don't know if I used it here. Yeah, common notation is a dot over dots represent a time derivative. You've probably seen that before. So here's our differential equation. If I substitute in, if I let x be x4 and x2, these two functions of time, what I'm going to get is, is this. Okay, I've substituted x1 and x, x as x1 plus x2. I'm just going to move the terms around. And the question is, is this a solution? If x1 and x2 are solutions, is the sum a solution? And you can see that it is, right? Because the fact that this is a solution means that this is equal to 0. The fact that this is a solution means that this is equal to So it is a solution. And we're, we're, it happens because we're dealing with a linear system. Now, when you have a nonlinear system, you can't add solutions. And everything is different. Okay? And we have an entire course on this here. It's called 4459. It's an elective course. It's nonlinear oscillations and waves. It's normally offered every spring. It wasn't offered this past spring. And, and now I'm paying the price because I have to do it. I'm doing a directed study on some students who want to take it. And I've been told, is Alex here? Is there an Alex Baines here? You're Alex? Okay. I've been told you might be interested in this course. Professor LaRaza told me. <laughs> <laughs> so do you know Will Swan? Uh, do you know, oh, I can't remember. There's been, I think another student's going to be in there too. Jeremy Hankins. Do you know Jeremy? Anybody know Jeremy? <laughs> what? He was in my last class. Okay. Yeah, okay, so. Anyway, this is... Uh, all right, I, I could talk about this for a long time, okay. Let me just... Oh yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Pam. Um, so this is an elective course. Uh, it's either Professor LaRaza or me. We're experts in nonlinear. We did our dissertations. My generation, just about everybody, in, when they did a PhD, it was in something nonlinear because it was so popular in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Chaos. You guys ever heard of chaos? I mean, it was just like a household word. And we never thought it would end. Well, you don't hear people talk about chaos much anymore. It's still there, and there's still a lot of interesting stuff going on. But anyway, that's the subject of this, nonlinear oscillations and waves. And because it's an elective course, there are no quizzes, just homework. And there are a lot of demonstrations. And some of them are original. And some of them we've published and some of them we haven't, okay? So anyway, so it wasn't offered for the first time in many years this past spring. And now you can see what the consequence of that is. All right. Uh, well, I've kind of drifted away from. Anyway, um, here's our differential equation from Hooke's law, Newton's second law. And uh, we can write a solution like this. There's our general. This is actually the general <coughs> solution. Now, what do we mean by general? Anybody know what that word general means? It has a specific meaning here. The general solution. Any motion of a mass on a spring can be written like this for our model. You just have to find the right amplitudes here. We have a second order differential equation, and we have two undetermined constants here. Remember, you guys from differential equations, you may remember that you need, for a general solution, you need that. So eventually we will prove, um, I think, we will prove that it is the general solution, but I'm not sure. There's an alternative way of writing this. You can write it instead of the sum of two sinusoids. Sometimes it's convenient not to do that. You can just write it as a single sinusoid, but with a phase shift here. 
It turns out when you add two sinusoids of the same frequency, you get a sinusoid of that frequency. But it can be shifted in time. So this right here, which is equivalent to this. Well, you'll notice we still have two constants, right? Here it's A1 and A2. Here it's an amplitude and a phase. So it's, this can be the general solution. And what it looks like, if we look at our x here as a function of time, is that it could look like something like this. And the phase, you know, it's not right on phase at a, a max or a min because of that phase constant here. So it looks like this. It just oscillates. As you know, you know the motion's going to look like this. Well, here's quantitatively what it looks like. It's a sinusoid. Now, let's see. We should first, I got the wrong order here. <laughs> the first thing you want to notice is, if we're going to quantify this, there's a period. The period is defined to be the time it takes to repeat. So is this the period from here to here? No, no. This is like swimming, okay? Maybe this is appropriate because there are some Olympics. Looks like the Olympics are really going to happen, huh? I don't know, I'm still suspicious. <laughs> okay, yeah, this is not, this is like swimming, you know, one lap, right? This is, this is just a half a lap. Here's the period, and we'll call it T0. Now, I've drawn it as this is from this zero crossing. You've got to skip this one because the motion hasn't repeated. You've got to go to this zero crossing. You can also go here, right, from one peak to the next or down here. We need a formula for that. How do I know when this thing's going to repeat? We'll s start at time t is equal to zero. Okay. How long do I have to go to get it to repeat? Now it's going to be over here. That's going to be the period. This time from here to here. We start off at time t is equal to zero, so we have the cosine of phi. To get for one repetition, for one cycle, this has to increment by 360 degrees, otherwise known as 2 pi radians. And radians is the natural measure of an angle here. So I start at zero. The period will be when this equals 2 pi. If you set this equal to 2 pi, <coughs> that's going to be, I can see that I didn't do this. Well, all you, oh, you can hear it is. So you can see, when t is equal to 2 pi over omega naught, this will be 2 pi. So that'll correspond to one period. So the period is 2 pi over omega naught. This is the time for one cycle. The frequency is 1 over that. So this is the number of seconds per cycle. It's given by this. The number of cycles per second, which we call this a hertz, is just the reciprocal. The frequency is, here it is, the period is 1 over the frequency or the frequency is 1 over the period. So this means that the frequency is going to be omega naught over 2 pi. So experimentally, this is what's usually important, is so many um, cycles per second, so many hertz. Incidentally, what is this? I heard, I heard somebody say this a few years ago and I just, I couldn't believe it. How do you say this? Anybody? One cycle. No, just say it. What's this? Hertz. One hertz, right? It's not one hertz. I actually heard a student here say that. And, I, uh, and since then, I've heard another student. I've heard several students say this. It just started to happen a few years ago. You know, things change. <laughs> and I just lost it. I couldn't. Well, anyway. Yeah, this is uh, named after Hertz. You, so you can look at things change. Do you mean we're all getting dumber? Yeah. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that. But you know, things do. Ch things just change, and 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 um, something something crept in there, and people thought Hertz was plural. You know, like seconds, right? Okay, so I, I don't know. Um, anyway, the period. Is 2 pi over omega. This is a parameter of our system, omega naught. And now we know, as someone asked, what, the, what that parameter is. It's called the angular frequency. Okay, it's best to think, go in this order. First of all, the period has to be given by this. We can see that from our expression right here. Next, the frequency is just 1 over the period. 
right? Now, this is convenient experimentally, as you will see again and again in this, in this sequence. However, theoretically, we don't, we don't want to deal with a 2 pi. We don't want to carry around 2 pi. So we deal with what's called the angular frequency, okay? The angular frequency is not the number of cycles per second. It's the number of radians per second. So that's how we interpret this omega naught. It is the square root of S over M, as we've defined it, and um, it's the number of radians per second. So this is theoretically convenient. This is experimentally convenient, as you will see. Now, there's something remarkable here. How does the period, or the fr one of the frequencies, depend upon amplitude? It doesn't. It doesn't. Not for simple harmonic motion. And it, it, yeah, and this is what part of what simple harmonic motion is. The period is independent of amplitude, which really isn't obvious if you think about it, but the math is telling us that it falls out, the amplitude falls out. And the reason it's falling out is Hooke's law. Hooke's law, this all goes back to Hooke's law, where the force is proportional to the displacement. <coughs> so we can test this, and if we need, Gene, let me know if we need more light. So here's an oscillator. Okay, it's a mass on a spring, and we're gonna look at vertical motion here. Now we already have a problem. Is this our model system? No, it's different. How is it different? It, there's an additional force here. In addition to the spring force, there's this constant gravitational force. But you can show, and I think it's reasonable, that the effect of gravity here, without gravity, this would be equilibrium right here like this. The effect of gravity is just to shift the equilibrium point down. Gravity, a constant force on an oscillator will not influence the frequency. It just changes the equilibrium. Now, if you don't believe that, and you know, I think it's a reasonable thing, but um, you can prove it. It takes a little bit of effort, but you can prove it. And I don't think we're gonna do that in this course, but I can't remember. So our theory is telling us that the period, see the period here, right? That's the same as the period here. Well, we can check this. That's what the timer is doing here. So let me start this off at a small amplitude. Is it say zero right now? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, eight. Okay. Did it work? Yes. Okay, 7.95. Is this the period? Nope. Now you have to divide by 10, right? Because for accuracy, we did 10. I don't want to do one, I'll be way off. So that's for 10. I understand it. Let me, let me reset it. It should be reset now. Okay, let's go to a higher amplitude. Hold on here. It's doing something I don't want it to do right now, but I'll show it to you in a moment. <coughs> okay, let's go to a bigger amplitude here. The reason I can't do a very big amplitude, you'll see why in a moment. Seven point nine one. Yeah, that's not bad. Okay. Now, we. This is our model system, right? But this is real. It doesn't really care what we think. Trust me, right? Let's look at larger amplitudes here. Hooke's law is still gonna be true, but watch what happens. Oops, I went a little too far. The spring went slack. Whoa. Why did it do that? How can motion like this cause motion like that? It's well, this is called. Component. Pardon me. Is it it's the construction of this, this frame? No, you're thinking of the next demo here. Uh, no, this motion actually, the longitudinal motion drives the pendulum motion. It's a non. It's um, it's called parametric excitation, and it's there's a whole chapter of it. I erased it in the in the course 4459. Okay, but I just wanted to point out to you that this is a real system. There's more than just one mode. We call it a mode of oscillation. This is one <coughs> mode. This is another mode, right? And high amplitude of this mode is causing, is ca is causing that. And incidentally, ships subject to waves can bob, there's names for this that I never remember, can bob up and down like that. It's a lot like this. 
And if you hit a condition here, where you start to drive the side-by-side -side motion. A ship going like this will start to rock side-by-side, -side, and this has happened. It's documented. There have been serious damage has been done to ships due to this effect. What you're seeing right here can happen for ships on a rough sea. And in one case, it was believed to have capsized a ship, but it's not well documented. It was in the 1800s. There's another mode, I think Robert was men mentioning this. There's another way that this system can, another mode of oscillation here. There's this, the longitudinal motion, which is what we care about. There's the pendulum motion. What's the other one? Torsion. Right. There's this twisting motion. And this is, in this case, this is a mass on a spring. This has been tuned. You see these little nuts here? It's been tuned to resonate. Watch what happens here. I started off in the longitudinal mode. <coughs> Where's our simple heart? harmonic motion? Now there's no longitudinal mode, but all the energy has gone into the torsional mode. And then it comes back. We're back to where we, approximately back to where we started from. This is called a Wilberforce oscillator, named after the person who invented it. I'm just showing it here to you as to point out that we're dealing with real systems here. They're going to do what they're going to do, right? We may just be thinking about longitudinal motion, but you can see you can get very different effects here. Okay, I think we're over. Oh, yeah, we are over. Okay, any quick questions? Okay, so we'll continue tomorrow, right?